I am Amber Hines. I am one of the organizers of WB Campus, and I was super excited to organize this panel discussion um, on building searchable databases. So I think, do we just want to start and have everybody here give a quick introduction to yourself? Should we start with, I see Kim, you're next to me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I can begin. So I'm Kim Henry. I'm a professor at Colorado State University. I have a joint appointment in the psychology department um, and in the Colorado School of Public Health. Wonderful. Cheryl, you want to go next? Yeah, I'm Cheryl Bowker. I'm the associate director of the STEM Center at Colorado State University. And Steve. Hi, I'm Steve Jones. I'm the uh, lead developer for Equalize Digital. Awesome. So I wanted to start by having, um, Cheryl, maybe you can go first. Can you describe some of the searchable databases that are present on the STEM Center's website, how they're used in the community, and um, sort of what, you were what the initial goals were for adding them to the website? Yeah. Um, first off, I guess I should start with what the STEM Center kind of does. <laughs> so you can see in my title, it's STEM as in Science, Technology, Engineering, Math. And we evaluate STEM education programs and also diversity inclusion programs. And we also, because of this work, we keep tabs on outreach and engagement programs related to STEM. So our audience includes um, professors. It includes even K-12 teachers, the community, basically anyone, um, because anyone can engage with STEM. And I will actually, share my screen and show you our website. Um, let's see if I can figure this out. Okay. Can everyone see that? We can't. You know what? We might need Tim to actually turn, add your screen into the event. Hopefully Tim is listening and he can do that. But while he's working on that, do you want to start yeah. describing? There oh, we go. Now awesome. You can see it. Okay. This is the awesome website that um, Amber and her team made for us. But um, we have three searchable databases. Um, the first one we have is across the top, events and activities. And this came out of the fact that, like I said, we have a lot of STEM engagement and outreach programs that Colorado State University does. And we wanted to show them or like have a directory of them, but it had to be more than just a calendar because a lot of these programs aren't specific to a date or time. They're just available um, for anyone to contact and even do school visits or whatever. And so if you go here, you will see that it doesn't look like a calendar at all. It instead lists um, year-round programs at the beginning. And if you scroll through, it will even have timed events, um, if there are. Um, we also wanted this to be searchable because we deal with so many engagement outreach programs that reach a wide um, audience. We wanted to highlight those that target a specific audience. So this, as you can see, the target population filter is on the left, but this could be K through five students, grad students, the public, all sorts of things. Subject area is also important. And the cool thing too about having, even though it's not a calendar, the events that do have a date and time, they'll show up on this database, but once that time passes, then they go away. Um, so it keeps it fresh looking um, and up to date, and that's something we don't have to manually do um, in the background, the STEM Center personnel. So that was the first database. Um, the second is, is funding opportunities, because um, our other audience that we work a lot with, is we work in on grants with them, getting grants, um, consulting with them on writing their grants. And I know that there is a ton of clearinghouse sites that does that for people, but we needed it very specific to our audience, which are university faculty that want to do some kind of STEM education or engagement um, 
research or program. And so we, the staff of the STEM Center, will go through um, the wide range of funding opportunities and just pull out the ones that would most interest the people we work with. And most of these are federal grants, but there are some um, private foundation ones. Um, and again, we have a um, deadline date for these applications. And if that deadline passes, then that event is no longer shown there. But the great thing for us as the people who have to maintain this um, database is the information is still there because you will notice a lot of grant funding opportunities. They come around every year. So once the year the date passes, we can just go in several months later once there's a new date announced, just change that and then it appears again. Um, so we don't have to re-enter the data or anything. And the third database we have, this is a newer one and this one's been a challenge for us. So the STEM Center has developed quite a Rolodex of contacts as far as people who do STEM education and outreach and engagement. And we felt like we were hoarding that those contact lists. I mean, we weren't intentionally. It just felt like people had to come to us to try to find other people who do this work. And we wanted to be a little more hands off and transparent about that. So we wanted to do a kind of a community directory. Um, and we called it the STEM community directory. So this allows people to sign up themselves to the directory. We um, do approve it once we review it. But this way, anyone, so this is, you don't have to sign in to see this page. So that way, if you're a teacher who wants to try to find a entomologist who will come to your classroom, you can search by um, the subject area that uh, the CSU staff, faculty, works in, you can see what kind of population they're comfortable with working with, and then you can contact them. Um, and the great thing about having the people sign themselves up to join this community directory is that they're giving permission, essentially, for people to contact them. So we're not like putting up a bunch of names um, and kind of throwing people under the bus when it comes to having them do um, engage with these uh, different audiences. So they're giving their permission. And uh, another cool thing about this directory is you can email them, communicate with them through our website. So it's not an external email service. Like it can go, you can contact them just via the website. Um, and I think, was that Amber, that was all you? Yeah, I think, I think that's a good introduction to your database. Kim, would you wanna share a little bit about um, the Colorado Wyoming um, Alliance for Minority Participation website? and then what um, database you recently added, which was the program service? Sure, so um, I'm part of the, um, the Colorado Wyoming Alliance for Minority Participation, which is um, an initiative that's funded by the National Science Foundation through the Lewis Stokes Alliance for Minority Participation Program. So there are um, alliances across the country and our alliance, um, which uh, includes uh, 14 schools across Colorado and Wyoming is one of them. And our mission is to help um, historically underserved groups um, get into um, STEM. So, so uh, complete bachelor's degrees in STEMs, matriculate into graduate programs in STEM and then secure jobs in STEM um, fields. And so um, we're primarily working with our partner institutions in Colorado and Wyoming, which include both community colleges and um, four-year colleges, um, and trying to work together to impact high impact or to uh, implement high impact practices at each of our campuses that that um, help more uh, minority students get into STEM. So one of the um, ideas we had last year was to create a searchable database that would give um, folks who are coming to our website and who are um, collaborators of ours, or it was to create, oops, I'm getting some feedback there. Am I, do I, can you hear me I okay? Think, I think you're okay. okay. Yeah. Um, to be able to search all of the different programs that are happening on campus. So at each of our campuses, so for example, at CU or at the University of Colorado, there are you know anywhere between um, five and 25 different um, 
opportunities for minority students to get involved in STEM. And um, before we put the searchable database on the website, um, the site coordinators at each university knew what those programs were, um, but there wasn't kind of a, a, a uh, default way that people could search what those opportunities um, were. And so we wanted to create something that worked both for our um, partner. So for example, if a, a uh, if one of our community colleges is trying to help a student interested in um, getting a bachelor's degree in math, look for what um, four-year um, colleges in Colorado or Wyoming would have opportunities for funding or um, summer research experiences or internships, um, they would have a, a, an ability to use, uh, use the searchable database to find those opportunities. Um, our intention also um, is to start um, advertising it widely, and that's something that we've yet to do. Um, that's something that um, is, is um on our docket for, for working on in the next year or so. But we also want to get um, information about the database out to, uh, for example, counselors in um, Colorado and Wyoming at um, high schools um, that can help students um, who are thinking about where to go to college, find um, where um, opportunities to help them fund their education, get involved in the kinds of um, activities or training programs that they want to be involved in, to, to just to be able to um, link, uh, link up students with the great programs that are already happening uh, in our state. So, so that was the, the uh, that was our intention with the database was um, to basically just capitalize on what's already happening, but make a, make a, a single place where people could search for those across um, Colorado and Wyoming and, and, and hopefully get more people applying for those opportunities and taking advantage of those opportunities. Right. Yeah, and I think we'll circle back in just a minute to like how you guys got all this data, especially when you're pulling from multiple schools and campuses. But I wanted to ask Steve, for the developers in the room, can you give a quick like behind the scenes? How are these built? You know, maybe what are some of the tools that we use? How's the structure within WordPress? Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, based on the specific requirements of, of each database, uh, typically what happens is in the discovery phase of the project, um, I'll be pulled in to meet with uh, the project manager to kind of discuss some of the data structure and how best to structure, uh, uh, like whether we're structuring things as taxonomies or as meta, and uh, we'll have that discussion um, for when the, uh, a lot of times this data is imported through a CSV file. And, and so we have to kind of have that data structure before we format the CSV file that then gets imported, but some of the uh, some of the technical stuff. So typically, these consist of one custom post type uh, with any number of taxonomies or post meta for filtering. Um, some of the uh, some of the plugins that we've used on CSU's websites are uh, uh, WP Advanced Search which is actually a deprecated uh, plugin that we've forked ourselves and made modifications to, um, uh, specifically to accessibility, to improve the accessibility of that tool. Um, we've also used another plugin called uh, WP Facet uh, for, for search. And, um, and that one, again, does require us to do some custom modification to improve the accessibility of, of it as well. And uh, there, uh, depending on the database, there are little custom modules that we've added to these. Uh, we've hooked in and created such as uh, like a CSV export where, where users can go through and select certain entries that they, that they want to then download uh, to their personal computer uh, in a CSV file. And uh, we've also done uh, like custom print modules where when you print, the page is cleaned up and simplified for, for a printer um, and, and, and optimized uh, in that respect, not to waste too much of the user's printer ink. So um, a, a couple other tools that we would utilize when we create these searchable uh, databases would use a relevancy plugin um, to 
uh, kind of refine that search if we in any way we need to to get it a, a little a little bit more accurate to the keyword that a user may be searching and um, in the uh, as I mentioned before we typically start with a CSV file that gets imported into the uh, custom post type and taxonomies and post meta that we've created and a tool that we typically use to get that data into the website is uh, WP all import. Uh, which is a, a great tool for uh, pulling in a CSV, attaching it to different fields of a post and generating posts, updating posts. Uh, you can rerun the import multiple times. Um, I know sometimes through the course of of creating a, a, a website or a searchable directory like this that the client will uh, have modifications before we launch. And so we can then just take the new CSV attach it and rerun the import in WPL import and all the data gets updated. So that's a, that's a, a brief run through of some of the technical stuff. Thanks. And I think that's a good segue too, because I wanted to talk about like how we gather the data and I think putting it, you know, building the CSV that tends to fall on um, like Kim or Cheryl, your teams had to do that. So can you talk a little bit about um, how you went about getting that and maybe any challenges and then how you address them? Yeah, Feel free to I'll go first. first. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, like I mentioned, we have three databases. Um, in our old website, that um, events activities database and that funding opportunities, we kind of already had that information. It was static on our old website. Because um, with events activities, we just mainly listed like a like a laundry list of programs that are available at CSU that does STEM education and outreach. Um, so. Luckily, we had some students at the time that we could pay, and they actually sifted through that laundry list. And it was actually a really good um, way for us to reconnect with some of these people that we haven't spoken to in a while. So we got to check in with them, verify that they were still offering this program, got their information, contact information, um, even had them describe the programs themselves instead of us, you know, the STEM Center, trying to interpret what they were doing. And um, the for the funding opportunity one, um, we again, it just, we had to get some students on board, dig through, make sure stuff was relevant, um, up to date. Um, and yeah, it, it was a manual process that took a lot of work um, in the front end. Yeah, so for our database, we really had to start from scratch. Um, and the way that, the way that Kowai AMP is, um, is formulated is that we have two full-time staff at CSU and then at each of our partner institutions there's one site coordinator but sometimes that person is a volunteer person sometimes they're paid a small amount um, they're often a, a faculty member in the, one of the STEM departments on campus so we really didn't want to burden um, people too much so um, we started with um, just trying to enumerate all of the um, programs, practices, and policies that were, were related to um, promoting STEM for underrepresented students at each of our 14 sites, um, and uh, then collected the information that we knew we wanted to appear on the website. So, for example, for each of the programs, um, we wanted to come up with um, who's eligible for them so that people could narrow down and get a smaller list that was most relevant to them. So, you know, based on their identity um, as a woman or a man or um, uh, based on race, ethnicity or major or veteran status and so forth. So we did our best to um, indicate who is eligible for each of those um, programs, practices, or policies once we enumerated them, and then to find, do a lot of just searching on the web to find contact information, because that was also important to us that once a person got a list of um, programs, practices, or policies that they would be eligible for, we wanted to make it really easy for them to be able to get in touch with the person that could help them apply for those opportunities. So, so we spent probably two or three months, our, our two full-time staff members um, probably spent two or three months just collating the best that we could do with the list to begin. And then we sent out um, the list that we collated to our partners so that they 
would hopefully have the vast majority of the work done and they could refine it. So for example, you know, the, we sent the list that we came up with for CU Boulder and their site coordinator was able to go through that list, make any corrections to the existing um, entries that we had and then add any that we missed. Um, and that probably took another month and then we were able to refine our, our complete list um, that, that we were able to pass on um, to Amber to, to upload. And that we, we uh, so we, we kind of um, uh, jumped the gun a little bit with this, um, with this website in that um, it's actually part of what we're proposing to do in the next round of our grant funding, but we had some leftover money. And so um, we wanted to try to get the bones of the site up um, with the money that we had. Um, and then we'll really start kind of adding to it and refining it. So some, some of the, some of the uh, steps that are needed to be constantly updating that with new, new programs, practices and policies and refining it for who's eligible and so forth. Those are things that will start um, putting protocols into place for how to do in the future. Um, but, you know, we want, we wanted to kind of get a good framework um, to start with, which I think that we, we definitely did. And we have a, a nice tool that um, is a good foundation for us to build on going forward. No, I, I'm, I think one of the things that's important from what both of you said is you probably can't underestimate or you shouldn't underestimate the amount of time it will take you to gather the data yeah. necessary to fill the database. Mm -hmm. It always takes longer, I think, than you think it will. Um, mm -hmm. And there's the idea of we want to have this thing and then actually filling it in a meaningful way that is usable, mm -hmm. I think, can be challenging. Um, I think it's great when you've got a team of people that can work on it instead of just one person having to fill it on their own. Mm -hmm. Steve, from a technical perspective, were there any yeah, I guess challenges that you think would be good to highlight? Yeah, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. yeah, just to add, I would say that for us, the challenge wasn't so much gathering the data because we knew it was out there. It was just putting the time and effort in. For us, it was figuring out the taxonomy, um, the mm -hmm. searchable text. Mm -hmm. That was because that was that means categorizing stuff that is very broad. I mean, that was difficult. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So figuring out what those filters actually should be that would be useful for the audience. Mm -hmm. I think I remember on the co -YAMP site, we had a whole discussion, maybe Steve remembers more about this too, about um, like, for example, when we're refining by gender, like, should it be that you check all of, like, should everything be tagged as for women or only the things that are for women only? Yeah. Right? Like trying to figure out like, how do you even choose which way to categorize things, mm -hmm. I think can be a challenge. Mm -hmm. Steve, I was going to ask you, is there anything on the technical side that um, you think would be worth discussing? Sure. Um, uh, sometimes with directories like this, like the data can, the import can definitely be a point of, of, of difficulty or it can raise a lot of issues but i think in in the instance of cs csu i think as as kim and cheryl just stated that the 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 work that they did the due diligence they did in in collating that data and and defining those taxonomies and stuff ahead made these projects for us uh, uh, fairly smooth in the import uh, process but sometimes in directories a lot of times that highlights a lot of a lot of issues where you have to go back and rework uh, the way things are structured a little bit, but mm -hmm. not so much the case with CSU. But I think, uh, like on the technical side, um, what, one point like uh, that really like with search and filter uh, plugins or, or extensions into Word on the WordPress platform. Uh, Sometimes we have to kind of dive into these plugins a little bit and modify them to improve their accessibility. So I, um, I know uh, we started making some of these filterable databases for CSU several years ago, and uh, we had to like uh, start extending these plugins to improve their accessibility. And uh, in doing so, sometimes these plugins don't make mm -hmm. all of the uh, all of their datable extensible through actions and filters. So you have to get real creative with ways to modify that code without uh, compromising the original source of, of that plugin. And, and what I mean by that is that 
that you still allow that plugin to grow and be updated on its own, but you also have this module that you've extended to, to improve the accessibility. So from a technical development standpoint, uh, for me, I think that was probably the most challenging, challenging part was mm -hmm. uh, in these, uh, the two plugins that I mentioned earlier in both of these instances, uh, we were required to kind of uh, dive under the hood quite a bit to Im improve the accessibility and to make these, because uh, search and filter uh, forms are very advanced. And, and if you, if, you just try to tab through them on your keyboard, uh, you, you'll notice that, that that's, that's an advanced search for, for somebody with access, you know, accessibility issues. So we try our due diligence to make sure that, that these, these filter fine with your mouse and that they, they filter just the same and just as well with your keyboard if you're tabbing through. And uh, so that was definitely the, the, the biggest challenge in these for me. Yeah. We have a question. So someone says, uh, Ed Beck says, he's really interested in the project that allowed users to fill out a form and then it would get approved. So on the STEM Center and then be published. Um, so he wanted to know a little bit more about how that is made on the back end. Okay. Yeah. So so technically, the the way that that's made is, so we're use of we we'll use a plugin called Gravity Forms for WordPress. And uh, Gravity Forms has the ability to add post fields to it. So we could add in like title, the body of the post, and then we can attach meta fields. So you're creating a form. And when that, and then you add that form to your page. And once that form is submitted, uh, Gravity Forms behind the scenes uh, will generate a post out of that. And so what we did was we defined that post to be set to draft or pending. Pending, I think. P pending. And, uh, yeah. and then a notification can go out to CSU to say, hey, there's a new pending uh, di directory post. And then they can click on a link, go over and, uh, and publish that post. And then it's, it's active in, in the directory. So basically, that's the only point where a person really has to touch it is just in that approval phase. And you can, depending on what you're trying to do, uh, you can skip that phase altogether. But uh, in, its, in its basic sense, that's, that's how it works. Now, it can get much more advanced, and uh, you could get into the realm of having to custom code what happens after that form is submitted by hooking into it and writing your own code. Um, but... Uh, on, on the surface level, that's basically how it works. And it, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. And I think in that instance, we were setting the, um, the user who submitted it, they were logged into an account. And so they're the author, right? And they have the ability to go in and update that post if they need to without CSU having to do anything. Is that right, Cheryl? Yeah, and that has been a lifesaver because that means, because before we had the community directory, um, we didn't have user set up. It was just a simple form submission for the events and activities. But we wanted to, um, we realized when we did the community directory, we wanted people to author their own profile, update it when they need to. And we all so Ooh, we might have lost Cheryl. Um, well, she is frozen, but I think, um, basically what she was saying is they were trying to get something that would save time so they have that although i think in other instances we've done things where even if someone wants to submit an update that also can be pending approval um kim i know your directory is pretty new um and you haven't done a lot to promote it do you have any have you done anything at all on that side or do you have any feedback on what post launch is like <laughs> no, so right now um, it's it's basically just being used internally. So um, each of our site coordinators are using it as they mentor students who are interested in in exploring what's happening on their campus or perhaps other campuses as well. Um, but ultimately, we want it to be used much more widely than that, and that's that's what's forthcoming for us. Um, so, like I said, we we. Um, one of one of for me one of the big initiatives will be um, 
compiling a list of all of the counselors at high schools and sending it out that way, giving them a little bit of a tutorial on how to use it um, and what benefits it can have. When we initially set it up, we set it up so that it could be used by a lot of different types of people. So students themselves, their parents that are looking for initiatives across Colorado and Wyoming campuses, counselors. So so I, you know, that that'll be a big push for us is thinking about how to um, increase the great information to get into the hands of the people that can use it. Yeah, I think I remember maybe Cheryl will come back in just a minute, but Cheryl, mm -hmm. you had told me at one point you were trying to motivate um, people across campus to join your community directory and you did something special. <laughs> Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, so sorry, I keep skipping out um, money. We um, paid them to join our directory. So you, Simple you as that. Funds. Straight up money. <laughs> you transferred funds like from your yeah, account so, to their um, account as a motivator? Yes, we have kind of a slush fund. It's our indirect fund where um, if, you know, our university audience will know what that means, their F&A fund. And we gave them $100 um, to complete a profile. And because we kept it with NCSU, um, they had to follow the allowability um, expenses of CSU, um, but we encourage them to spend it on STEM engagement and outreach uh, resources or supplies. Um, but yeah, so that helped a lot. <laughs> do you do you feel like that's something that um, colleges or universities, if they're building something like this, that they need to do that in order or to get engagement? Um. It depends on your audience, I guess. So um, unfortunately, a lot of people who do STEM engagement and outreach, um, they lack funding to do that. I mean, um, and plus, I mean, it's a small amount of money that they usually, they usually need is like supplies or snacks or food or whatever for events. Um, and so that was great for our audience to have like no strings attached money um, that they could spend on that. Um, yeah. That's a, it's a good point. Well, the crazy thing, too, is like even though we gave them money and they filled out this directory, they still feel like they owe us. So um, we kind of have them on the hook um, when we need something in the future. <laughs> so for our center, like it's been great because we can ask a little bit more of them. Like, hey, we're writing this blog post. Can I interview you? Or, hey, can you write a blog post for us? Um, mm -hmm. So it has its it has it's benefits beyond just having them join a directory like it mm -hmm. it helps other aspects too <laughs> and on the user end on yours because yours have been around for a while like the funding directory especially in the programs and events um uh, is do you get good feedback do you see people using it yeah um events and activities we can see because i get those submissions from other people and then um also i can submit um on behalf of the STEM Center. That's been, there's always that events and activities being posted. So that's great. Um, but in opportunities, we don't have a good indicator. So I can have look at Google Analytics and see how often that page is, um, users go to that page. And it's been good. Um, actually, we got a recommendation from one of our uh, research professors um, that we include the a subject area of grants that are for explicitly diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I was like, oh, that's a great idea, because up until this, we were just focused on education, um, research, and programming. And so we've included that, and that has actually increased our page views. So being able to, you know, listen to our audience to see what they want to see in our database. Um, the community directory, I have, we, I mentioned we have that feature where um, people can correspond via our email or via email through the site. And I have access to all those and I haven't seen anyone use that feature, <laughs> but I know they're communicating external to the directory. Um, so I don't, we should, or I need to explore what's with the, why not using the internal communication if that's a feature we even need anymore? Um, I'm not sure, but yeah, I have gotten, I do have um, news that yes, they are using it. <laughs> that's good, that's good. Um, so we have another question going back to the accessibility. 
Um, someone from uh, uh, University of Wisconsin Madison, I guess, wants to know. Can you give any more details on the accessibility updates that were made to the plugins? And then um, Emily Barney asked if we have our forked plugins or accessibility e edits to them shared anywhere, which I think we do. Yes, yes. Um, the, w the WP Advanced Search, I believe, is in our GitHub. And that would be on the Roadware Creative GitHub, right? I believe so, yes. We're weird because we uh, rebranded, <laughs> so <laughs> right, we right. GitHub. <laughs> so that's on uh, Roadware WP is a GitHub name for that one. Right. So uh, on that one, some of the accessibility updates. So a lot of a lot of times, it's just the way that uh, the check boxes are formatted, like check boxes and radios. Uh, there's a certain format that they need to be in. Uh, there needs to be a field set around them for proper tabbing and there needs to be proper labels. Um, so, so a lot of times it, it's as simple as, as just reformatting that. Uh, a lot of times developers tend to just stick with using divs or spans to do certain things, but uh, we just have to make sure that there's proper labels on input fields and that there's proper labels on checkboxes and radios. And uh, uh, so I, I believe that's the main issues with that, unless Amber remembers anything else. Um, and yeah, then I think with, adding field sets. Yeah, field sets on on checkboxes and radios. Um, on the uh, uh, facet WP, uh, on that one, there we had several several more updates. Um, I wish I could remember them all off the top of my head, but uh, and and the, this is a set of code that we actually do use with this plugin when we use it on any website. Um, and uh, I don't believe we have that code uh, publicly available right now. I know we were uh, working on it. So uh, that one is on our Equalize Digital GitHub account. Okay. It doesn't okay. have, the README doesn't have a normal WordPress plugin README. Like it doesn't look, because we don't have it ready to share yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but you can install it and activate it and it works. The main what? README, I think, just has some notes about what it does right now. Right. Uh, so some yeah. of the so some yeah. of the main issues on that again were like field sets and stuff, and then uh, just tab locations for uh, pagination. Uh, I know that we made several updates to the like if you paginate and, the directory by like ten posts, you know, and it'll show like you know there's so many pages of this. I know we made several updates to that, and uh, and uh, right, yeah. Yeah, and also I think with Facet we had to do a lot with ARIA labels. Uh, Correct. They Correct. have like an ARIA or like an accessibility filter that's turned off by default and you can turn it on, but it doesn't, to be totally clear, <laughs> honest, it doesn't really do much. Like, so we had to, and I think that's almost all JavaScript on that. Yeah, yeah. That, um, we, I did recently discover, um, it's called wpgridbuilder.com. And I think we're looking at using that in our next directory project that we do because it's actually coded with inputs instead of divs. Right. <laughs> um, and like just out of the box seemed really good for accessibility. So I think if someone's looking for that, I would recommend like starting there. I mean, you obviously could use our fixes, but I almost am like, I'd rather start with something that has a better base than try to patch um, something else. Um, let's see, somebody wanted to know, do you, let's see, Mandy wanted to know, do we all, or do you all use content syndication or RSS feeds, for example, specific department to display on specific site or department from your shared database? And I don't know if, she, <laughs> that's probably a question for Steve, but I'm pretty sure the answer is no. You guys aren't using any RSS feeds to like send the information from your database anywhere else, are you? No. no. Yeah, I mean, outside this, outside of the scope of, of WordPress core, I mean, I think core will expose uh, those custom post types to RSS feed um, just kind of out of the box. But uh, we haven't done anything custom to customize that. Um, I think in the same respect, you, you could utilize the WordPress API to expose that data into its own. You can make your own custom endpoints of this directory if you really wanted to. And then you could provide those endpoints to, you know, other vendors or other pieces of software that your university creates to pull that directory information in, in it as well. 
so that the website could serve as like one source of that that information. Mm -hmm. uh, so in our last few minutes, I think those were the last questions. I'm wondering, does Cheryl and Kim or Steve, if you do you have any general recommendations for any um, universities that are looking at implementing something like this and trying to make their website more of an interactive tool? Any last thoughts? For uh, us at the Sim Center, we're a small unit. There's just three, sometimes four or five, depending on if we have grad students or undergrads working for us. And so having some of the work outsourced to our audience themselves, the users themselves, has been key. So like having those forms, having them where they can create their own user account um, has been great because that means we're, it makes sure that it keeps the users engaged um, because they kind of have a um, piece of the pie. And then it makes for more accurate data because it's coming straight from the source. And then as Steve mentioned, I mean, on our end, we will just see a pending approval form and we just scan it, you know, make sure it's not um, a bot or something or someone not affiliated with the university. And we just hit approve like it's so simple. Um, so that's been really key. Do you have any thoughts, Kim? You know, I don't really. I, I guess I would just say that it was um, surprisingly easy and affordable um, to uh, create this. Um, and, you know, I, I have high hopes that, um, you know, once we get it, get it advertised, that it's going to be a really useful resource. So, you know, from my, my final thoughts are just, you know, if you if you have um, if you have a big database that you want people to be able to easily use and uh, make the most use of that it seems like a it seems like a great way to go. Mm -hmm. What about you, Steve? Any last tips or thoughts from the dev side? Um, no, I mean, maybe just an overarching that I mean, I think through through doing these directories for CSU that, you know, it's really like highlighted that uh, universities are very data rich. Uh, organizations, you know, with all their uh, departments and resources and courses and activities, opportunities. Uh, so there's, I think there's definitely, uh, there's definitely a good use for presenting your data in a very useful way to the end user. Uh, uh, especially nowadays, more people at home, uh, just having that information at their fingertips, I think is very helpful. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you all for joining me and talking about uh, databases and data and display and search and filtering and accessibility. Um, if anybody has any follow-up questions, do either of you want to say where they could get in touch with you? Do you have like, I know STEM Center has a Twitter handle. Um, yeah, sure. And I'm, I'm happy to connect. Um, probably uh, connecting via email at first is the best way to go. My email is just kim.henry at colostate.edu. Mm -hmm. And how about you, Cheryl? Yeah, and we have our Twitter, we have our website where you can send an email through our website or you can reach me directly. Um, my email is Cheryl.Balker at colostate.edu and that information is also on our website. Uh, we have everything. Just go to our website. <laughs> so, yeah. And Steve, if they have any dev questions or follow up. Sure. Uh, you can contact us through any of the uh, social channels that Equalize Digital is associated with or reach out to me personally on my email, steve at equalizedigital.com. All right. I think we might be ending like a couple minutes early, but I feel like we've kind of covered it all and that was all of our questions. So thanks, everybody. <laughs>